Hey there, everyone. Happy Monday. Happy April. Happy Q2. I'm Dave Keller, Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. And this is the final bar. Q1 wrapped up last week in our shortened uh, holiday week uh, before the Easter holiday. And uh, in a position of strength, I would argue, right, overall. And as we documented through January and February and March, that initial up thrust off of the October low last fall with a strong November and December leading the way to a strong January, February, March, I would argue surprisingly strong given the seasonal tendencies, which is usually a major low in March. One thing we did not have was a major low of any sort, and we really didn't have any meaningful drawdown to speak of in the month of March. At worst, the market consolidated for a very short term uh, time frame before uh, continuing that uptrend uh, to the upside. We have a great guest today, Julius DeKempener of RRG Research is going to be joining us here in the Stock Charts TV studio, uh, which is a lot of fun having him uh, here in town. We'll talk about rotation, and as uh, I think you'll see from our conversation, offense over defense, still the rule of the day. Having said that, did Q2 start off with any surprises, any unusual movements? Let's get to our market recap and see how things played out through today's Monday trading session. Before we get to the charts, we do want to tell you about a poll we had going on our social media accounts. So make sure you give us a follow anywhere you see Stock Charts TV. And we asked you which macro ETF do you think performs best over the next three months? Q2, where do you want to be? Stocks, bonds, or gold? The SPY got 48% of the vote. Gold, the GLD, 36%. And then bonds, TLT, only 16%. So about half of us saying stocks are going to be the best place to, uh, to be. I would probably honestly say gold, although I think stocks and gold probably both in a pretty decent shape right now. The only chart I don't think is particularly strong at the moment is, is the chart of bonds, right? The TLT is actually looking, uh, looking relatively weak. Let's actually start there and look at the chart of the, uh, the TLT. I was looking at interest rates earlier before we were uh, going live with the show, and it's interesting. You have the S&P and the NASDAQ at or near all-time highs. You have gold making new all-time highs last week. Uh, a lot of other commodities, uh, oil prices at least making a new three-month high, breaking above $80 a barrel here in the last couple of weeks. Bonds, a notable outlier. Bonds are actually at the lower end of this pattern. I don't know if I would call it a descending triangle pattern, but I probably would. A descending triangle pattern, it's not perfect, but it's pretty close, right? That's where you have a flat support level, a consistent level of support around $92 for TLT. And then you have a slanting downwards uh, upper trend line, right? So connecting the highs in December, January, and March, and then late March sort of making almost a really perfect trend line here. That sort of descending triangle usually resolves lower. And what that means is that if and when the TLT breaks below 92, which it did not do today, but not too far below current levels, half a point uh, below uh, Monday's close, you get below 92. And all of a sudden, this is completing a, uh, a bearish price pattern and suggests further downside. I mean, not all the way down to uh, previous lows, but certainly in the neighborhood of the October lows. So you have the situation where stocks still remain strong, gold still remains strong, bonds very much not so. Uh, also, I would say a break below 92, I'd also be looking at that momentum, right, in the form of the RSI. The RSI breaks below 40 on that price breakdown. That would be a uh, significant sell signal suggesting higher rates, lower bond prices. Uh, but for now, uh, sort of holding up there uh, okay. Let's go back to the dashboard. Sorry, a little bit of a diversion there into the chart of bonds. But let's see how things played out on today's session. The Dow finishing lower 0.6%. The S&P 500, really the main U.S. benchmark I would uh, follow, uh, finishing the day just below 52.44. That's down 0.2% from last Thursday's close before the holiday weekend. The Nasdaq Composite slightly higher. So you have Nasdaq up, Dow down, and the S&P stuck in the middle. Mid caps and small caps both in the red as well, with the S&P 600 small cap index down 1% to 1330. The VIX pushing a little bit higher here. It finished uh, the end of last week right at uh, almost perfectly at 13. Uh, we're up to around 13.7. So VIX below 15 is still a low volatility environment. That's kind of the basic threshold that I would look for. I actually have an alert set on stock charts to uh, email me, to hit me on the cell phone, when, I won't say if, but when the VIX breaks 15, because what that will tell you is we're in an elevated volatility uh, environment. By the way, I also have an alert set for when, if and when the VIX would break above 20 and if and when it would break above 29, because those are the other thresholds I think are pretty, uh, pretty meaningful and suggest further and further of a concerning level of fear uh, rampant in the markets. For now, though, we're not seeing any of that. The VIX below 15 still is a low volatility, slow and steady incline for risk assets. 
As I mentioned, looking at the bond markets, bonds going lower today. The TLT was down almost 2%, which is one of the worst days we've seen here in uh, recent history. Interest rates are all moving higher, of course. So you have the 10-year yield up, uh, let's see, 433, we'll call it. The long bond yield around 447. The short-term, excuse me, the five-year yield around 434. So the 10-year point, really that main point that we would look at, a lot of things sort of derived from that, uh, that sort of mid-curve uh, point on the, uh, for the U.S. Uh, Treasury yield curve, currently around 433. So higher rates from here usually mean uh, things are getting a little less, uh, little less ideal for uh, certainly for growth stocks, although the relationship between growth and value and interest rates have not been the normal trajectory. Uh, growth stocks have done fine in higher, uh, higher rate environments, but now you're starting to see uh, non-growth stocks, more value stocks, uh, doing a lot better. So that's certainly an emerging theme to pay attention to. The dollar index up about 0.4%, we'll call it, with the UUP, which is a uh, bullish dollar ETF, finishing the day around 285. Dollar's starting to break out a little bit, and you're seeing the dollar breakout, gold, crude oil, all making three-month highs here in the, uh, in the last week. Certainly an emerging theme, uh, potentially, to, uh, to follow on. Looking at the commodity space, the DBC, which is a broad commodity ETF, finished today up half a percent. Gold, 1% higher. Silver, half a percent higher. Copper, oil prices all moving higher. So sort of the energy and precious metals part of the, uh, of the commodity space doing quite well today. Natural gas prices uh, pushing higher as well. You know, we've talked about how energy stocks tend to be a good play when oil is doing well, right? Crude oil prices are stronger. The number one thing you, you think about, or at least I think about, is that's probably great for energy stocks. And it's usually not directly hurting airlines and uh, consumers and others that need to use fuel to get places. Uh, but it's usually, um, you know, usually sort of a, a headwind there. But it's not as much of a direct play because there are a lot of things that affect a, you know, a consumer business, like a retail business, not just how, how expensive it is to, uh, to get there in your car. Uh, airlines certainly have to deal with that, but they have a lot of other things that are uh, that they're dealing with as well. A lot of other drivers, energy stocks. It's literally a direct play on on the price of crude oil and how much money they can make getting oil out of the ground and getting it to where you you need it. So oil prices going higher, which they have, certainly a, a pretty decent uh, uh, sign for energy stocks. Crude oil above eighty dollars a barrel. That was the main uh, level we've been uh, talking about. Cryptocurrencies, I feel like every Monday when I've come in here, and I may just be making this up, but I'm pretty sure when we come in on Monday, I feel like there's a lot of red on here. I feel like the weekends have been especially noisy. I haven't really looked at Bitcoin volume in any way, but I would assume over the weekend it's a lot less, uh, less liquid, or a lot lighter trading, although it, it is trading 24-7. So uh, there's always a market out there uh, somewhere. But Bitcoin for today down about 2.6%. Over the weekend, we got up to around 71,000 to we'll call it two, uh, 300, uh, and then rotated back lower. So once again, we're sort of teasing that 70,000 level above and below that big round number of resistance. Ether prices uh, currently right around 3480, we'll call it, down almost 5% from uh, Sunday. Looking at the 11 S&P sectors, you can see three in the green, communication services, energy, and technology. So two of the FANG sectors and one of the energy, or excuse me, one of the uh, value sectors, energy up, uh, today, uh, communication services at the top of the leaderboard up 0.8 percent, energy up three quarters of a percent, technology up about 0.3 percent. Everything else today was down. Real estate at the bottom of your list down 1.8 percent, healthcare and consumer staples, industrials as well, all down about 0.8 percent from uh, Thursday's close. Looking at the, you know, I was actually reading an article on the Wall Street Journal, uh, getting away from the magnificent seven label. We've been using air quotes. To, uh, to describe this group of stocks. I don't even have seven names, so it's becoming less and less of a meaningful one. Um, so we are getting some speculation. I think it was the Fab Four we're getting here, a, sort of a March Madness play. I don't mind that one. Uh, and really just hitting on the top ranked names. So it's the Meta, Microsoft, Amazon, NVIDIA, uh, as opposed to the others, which are a little less, uh, a little less strong at the moment. Uh, but overall, when you look at this group of stocks, Tesla and Apple, which have been the worst performers of this group of eight uh, lost uh, some ground today with Apple down 0.9% right at that 170 level uh, and Tesla around 175, that's down about a third of a percent. Alphabet actually bouncing 3% higher today. So uh, kind of a nice mean reversion after there's been a choppiness to that chart uh, here in uh, recent weeks and months. Let's go to a daily chart of the S&P 500, see how things uh, evolved through the course of the trading day today. I mean, not a big move in the daily chart. I mean, if you look at the last you know, year and a half or so. I'm going back to the beginning of uh, 2023 just to show 
the trajectory uh, from uh, early 23 all the way to where we're at today. I have this little green line right around 5,200, and that's sort of what I would call tactical support. What I like to do with a chart like the S&P 500 are have lines in the sand, sort of a level. And the way that I think you remain calm and cautious and relaxed through market turmoil, which I would argue we're sort of always in, but especially now where there's a lot of speculation about whether we're at a top and whether Q2 cannot be nearly as strong as Q1 really ended up being. You know, I like to draw some simple lines on the chart. And as long as we hold above those lines, there's not much to worry about. We start breaking these lines, then you need to revisit long positions, revisit your bullish thesis, whatever it is that uh, is uh, sort of uh, however you would describe your, uh, your, your view on this market that keeps making higher highs and higher lows. Look for a sign that that's changing. This little green line is what I'd call a tactical support level. It's right at 5,200. That's been the swing low here for the last uh, week or two. Below that, the thick pink line for me is at 50-50. The 50-day moving average is almost exactly at that level right here. I think that's the line, right? That's the line in the sand. And what that means is you got about a 200-point drop potential between where we're at now and where we would be there. That's not even a 10% move, right? That's like a, um, what would we call that? A 200-point move. That's, I mean, maybe a 3 4% drop from current levels would get you down to, uh, to that point. That would mean anything below there, that's sort of, you know, certainly the biggest drawdown we've had since the October low. One of the biggest drawdowns we've had since the October 22 low uh, and sort of would be, uh, would be one of the, uh, the big drawdowns that you would probably see on the weekly chart as well. We haven't seen any of that deterioration, right? In the short term on the daily chart, the trend has been remarkably consistent. That's what a low VIX sort of uptrend kind of looks like. So in terms of potential changes, I think 5,200 is that first level that I have an alert set for. 5050 is really the big one. As long as we hold that, conditions just aren't getting too bad. The breadth conditions overall remain quite strong here. This is the percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average, finishing the day around 84%. That's a lot, right? That means eight and a half out of every 10 S&P stocks are above their 200-day moving average, which is you know just a good long-term you know, measure of trend, now, what you have to remember is the S&P is about 600 points, about 15% above its own 200-day moving average. That's a pretty big way to get down to get to, get to that 200-day moving average. And a lot of uh, stocks are in that similar, uh, I guess, conundrum where they're so far away from their 200-day moving average, it would take a climactic loss to get down to that point. It would probably take a, a good bit of time to, uh, to do so. So I think in this sort of environment, looking at the bottom panel, which is the percent above their 50-day moving averages, I think that's an important one to watch because that will usually reflect some short-term weakness much more quickly. You'll note we're right around 81%. We get to 90%. I don't know if we'll have a red flag graphic, but I will definitely uh, you know, articulate that we're at a concerning level of uh, breadth extremes. When breadth gets really bullish, it's kind of like when sentiment indicators like uh, the AAII survey, their name exposure index, Get super overheated. It just tells you your contrarian uh, sort of mindset uh, pops in, at least for me, uh, and tells me to uh, expect some sort of pullback from extreme euphoric levels, right? From extreme optimism. We're not quite there yet. And I think if we get up to 90% on this bottom indicator, that would tell me to be ready for, uh, for a meaningful uh, pullback. Uh, we're close, but we're not there uh, quite yet. Another interesting uh, discrepancy, or I guess divergence to tell you about, and this is one I want you to keep in mind. Uh, as we prepare for our conversation with uh, Julius DeKempner, because we're talking a little bit about rotation between growth and value. When you look at the S&P 500's bullish percent index, it's currently around 75. You can see we pulled back in uh, January, February, and rotated back up, which means three out of every four S&P stocks are in a bullish point and figure uh, setup. If you look at the NASDAQ 100, you can see we're currently around 57%. And that gap from you know this uh, S&P being up around 75%, and the Nasdaq 100 being down around 58%, and the fact that it really hasn't gained much uh, from, this, uh, from this downtrend here, the growth leadership is taking quite a bit of a break. And we're seeing that with Tesla and Apple today and really in recent weeks as well. Uh, the value uh, sector is actually doing quite strong. That's why the breadth conditions overall remain uh, fairly, uh, fairly constructive here. Just to finish off, I want to tell you uh, as our market recap uh, wraps up, uh, looking at some of the leading names, so uh, those Fab Four names uh, that I jotted down, NVIDIA, uh, Meta, and I'm going quickly through the uh, charts here, Microsoft, and Amazon. And what is one consistent feature with every one of those charts that I just showed you? And I would encourage you to look at the RSI. So each one of these charts, it's the 
two-year daily chart with the 50 and 200-day moving averages. Notice that I believe all four of these are above two upward sloping moving averages. That's a bullish trend. But look at the momentum, which is sloping downwards on Amazon, which is sloping downwards on Microsoft from January through uh, now early April. You can see Meta as well making a new all-time high in March on weaker momentum. And we can see the same thing for NVIDIA, right, making a new closing high, uh, not quite getting above 1,000, but getting a new closing high around 950 on weaker momentum. So all four of those leading sort of fab four names still making higher highs and higher lows. Let's be clear. They are still, by any trend-following definition, Charles Dow or otherwise would say this is an uptrend, but the momentum is waning on all four of those charts. And I think that's the risk to certainly our major benchmarks, which are dominated by these names and growth leadership names like these. These uh, bearish divergences play out, and that's an ugly reality for, uh, for the market environment. Next chart I want to show you is just uh, looking at growth versus value. And uh, this is a, a chart that's part of my Mindful Investor Live chart list. This is a group of charts that I keep updated on the Stock Charts platform. I would encourage you to check these out, and I'll show you in a minute how you can get to this list of charts. If you're just joining us uh, here for the first time and haven't seen uh, the, uh, the chart list before, but the top panel and bottom panel are showing you two ways of describing the growth versus value relationship. On the top, we're using the Russell 1000 growth and value ETF, so IWF versus IWD. The bottom panel is showing you what are called the pure growth and pure value uh, uh, indexes, uh, and use, all of these are using ETFs. Uh, and basically, the tickers there, by the way, if you're not familiar, RPG and RPV. Now, why would we use the two of these together? So this is the most commonly used uh, you know, uh, comparison. Use, use either the S&P or Russell growth and value indexes or ETFs. They, they're pretty much the same in terms of their charts and their relative movements. So if this line is sloping downwards, value outperforming growth. If the line is going up, growth outperforming value. You can see growth over value has been essentially a very consistent story from the beginning of 2023 to the beginning of February of this year, so over a year. But if you look at the last six weeks, you can see that value has been outperforming growth. And that is, uh, I think, reflected in the bullish percent indexes, that divergence that I showed you uh, a couple charts ago, where the uh, NASDAQ is coming down while the S&Ps is uh, moving back higher, as a lot of more value-oriented stocks are doing better. Uh, but you're also seeing this ratio go down uh, on the pure growth and pure value ETFs. Now, the difference here is there are some stocks that are double counted that are considered both growth and value. I think a name like Microsoft uh, you know, shows characteristics of both. It's in a growthy sector and still is growing in, in a lot of ways uh, uh, consistently, but it also has some of the uh, uh, conditions or some of the uh, characteristics of a more established blue chip company in terms of its size and uh, its stability. And so the pure growth and value just looks at those buckets of stocks that are not double counted, but single counted on one or the other. This is also rotating lower in the month of March. So while the markets made new all-time highs in March in terms of our benchmarks, growth over value over the last six to eight weeks is really favoring value over growth. And we continue to see opportunities in non-growthy sectors and, uh, and other names. Name, I'll, I'll highlight a couple of them that are, uh, that are having nice bounces today. And the first one, in decidedly a non-growth sector. I mean, arguably the opposite of growth would be something like 3M, right? A, well-established industrial stock. This is in a subgroup in the industrial sector called Diversified Industrials, 52 billion market cap, a well-known name. Look at the pattern here. Today, we gapped, uh, really didn't gap actually, that's not true. We overlapped with Thursday's session, but a higher open and actually closed higher through the course of the day. Uh, 3M by the end of the, the, uh, the trading day uh, may have been the top gainer in the S&P. If not, it was one of the top, uh, top three or four names, up about 6% today. And today's higher close really makes, uh, almost, you know, really is a 12-month uh, new high, right? It's literally a new 52-week uh, closing high today. And look at that resistance level, right around 90, 90, 50. That was the high from July, uh, from uh, December, and here from March. And as I'm saying that, I want to remind you, right, when you're looking at a high, um, uh, a, um, uh, a, uh, High yielding stock like uh, like 3M. You want to make sure that you take the adjustments off of there. So there's a looks like there's a dividend or something that was paid today. So I'm now making a note to dig into this a little bit further on an adjusted basis. It actually looks like it was breaking out, but on a an unadjusted basis, which means you're taking the um, uh, dividends. Looks like a big dividend that was paid today, and that probably is causing that big uh, discrepancy here. I'll circle back with the charts here later today, but keep an eye on that one. Now, the reason why I think the adjusted chart can be helpful is because this is literally looking at 
what has happened day to day in terms of the pure price and really investor behavior. So this uh, stock moving higher basically means on an adjusted basis, uh, we're continuing to uh, break out. But on an unadjusted basis, which means you're taking that uh, dividend adjustment out, you see this big gap lower here. So a good reminder that there are two differences to, uh, to think about. Other charts to highlight would be Micron, a semiconductor stock, one of the top gainers in the S&P. Again, while some growth stocks are struggling, semiconductors are not that. Look at the relative performance in Micron. Look at the gap higher uh, in March and the continued push to the upside. The momentum is quite strong, but overall, this is a stock making higher highs and higher lows. And generally speaking, I like looking for names that are consolidating and then breaking out. When arguably, with a bit of a bull flag pattern, that's where you have an uptrend, and then a pattern of lower highs and lower lows, sort of a uh, parallel downtrend channel, a shorter time frame, and then we break out to the upside. Nice upswing in one of the gambling names that have been consolidating recently. A couple quick announcements before we bring on today's guest, Julius DeKempener. First off, I want to remind you all, we love hearing from you. We're going to do a mailbag episode uh, later this week. We also had a great mailbag episode on Friday. We would love to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag show Email is best, the final bar at stockcharts.com. Here on YouTube, of course, you can just drop a comment below the video you're watching. We'd love to hear from you and hope to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag episode. Also, I will be speaking at the Money Show's upcoming Investment Masters Symposium. This will be in Silicon Valley. So if you're in the Bay Area or can get there easily, check it out May 7th through 9th. If you scan the QR code on your screen or click a link in the description, you can get access to sign up for this event. I'll be doing two events. I'll be doing a quick workshop earlier in the week, and then I'll also be doing a two-hour masterclass called Seven Questions to Ask Before Every Trade. I will literally be showing you my seven steps on my technical analysis checklist, what each of those items are, why they're on my checklist, and we'll look at some examples together. Hopefully, you will leave there with a good sense of what your technical analysis checklist could look like and some great ideas about how to improve your own decision-making. So make sure you scan that QR code or click on the link in the description to uh, attend that event coming up in May. I want to welcome on today's guest, Julius DeKempener. Julius is the founder of RRG Research. He's a senior technical analyst, really helps uh, spearhead our data effort here at StockCharts.com. Often talking to him uh, from the Amsterdam uh, area Today, thankfully, here in our studio. Welcome to Redmond. How are you, Julius? Thank right. you. I'm fine. Yeah, just recovering from my little jet lag. But, yeah. <laughs> you're always so uh, chipper when you get here, though. I'm impressed how, you, uh, how you're able to make the transition. Well, the, the good news is that when I come here, I gain nine hours. That helps, right? You know, so that helps. <laughs> West you know, so, is best, I was yeah. told. So looking at the markets here, obviously, the S&P, the NASDAQ, finished Q, uh, Q1 incredibly strong, right? At or near all-time yeah. highs. We're now beginning Q2. When you think about what we observed in the first quarter and look forward, are, do you find yourself more optimistic, more cautious, and why? Um, st still optimistic, yeah. but cautious. So cautiously optimistic is probably the best way to describe it. I like it. Because um, like everybody else, I'm watching these markets go higher. And like, seriously, is this, how far is this going to go? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think this is like a really American term when you go to a football stadium, like where, where are you seated? In nosebleed area. Yeah. You know, that's like... <laughs> the market's in the nosebleeds. That sounds that like we're in nosebleed area. So <laughs> the big question is, are we, are we going to come crashing down and into yeah. some sort of a correction? Yeah. Or are we going to have a more mildly like sideways, slightly down correction? Yeah. And where will it start? Because, yeah. you know, I don't see it starting right now. I mean, it's... We got to admit to ourselves that at someday it will happen, but yeah. the question is when and how strong. Yeah. And um, when I look at the markets right now, and especially at the sector rotation bit of it, I don't see super negative signs. That is a yeah. bit of my, I, you know, maybe it's some sort of a bias that after such a long run, you want, you really want to see some negative signs, yeah. but you can't really find them, and that's yeah. like. What am I going to do with this? Sort so, of where we're at. <clears throat> yeah, and and um, you know, if you look at the sector rotation bit, uh, obviously using RRG, then um, there's a couple of things that you that 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 at least catch my eye. And sure. The first thing is that on the weekly RRG that you got up on the screen right now, uh, there's a very clear opposite rotation for staples versus discretionary, mm. and discretionary is moving higher, staples moving lower. That is a positive sign, you know. Um, in in a in a strong market, consumer discretionary stocks are expected to do way better than consumer staple stocks. Yeah. 
Yeah. That seems to be happening now. So that is not a sign of a bear market or something that is rolling over. The second thing is, if you look at the weekly RRG and you combine that with the daily RRG, mm. then what you will note is that the, uh, the rotations are kind of conflicting. They are not right. in sync with each other. And, and I think that, is, that describes best the confusion is probably too strong of a word, but okay. hesitation in the yep. market. Like we, we really don't know what is the primary direction and the fact that your weekly tails are in many cases opposite to the daily tails yeah. <clears throat> is, is telling us that there is some sort of hesitation going on. Um, and and if, you, if you blend that together and you align it, you come out at some sort of a you know, sideways digestion of the recent rally and maybe some sector rotation going on yeah. into other sectors that have been lagging so far um, and that could sort of offset and counter the money outflow that we're seeing, uh, especially in the tech sector, I think. That's where you clearly yeah. see some hesitation the, going on. These charts that we're looking at, by the way, come from an article you wrote last week on stock charts, uh, you know, really talking about this rotational aspect, focusing in a little bit on offense versus defense. And I yes. guess one of the themes we really haven't observed yet our defensive sector is really mounting a meaningful rally, right? You saw Staples sort of, you know, sort of uh, come back a little bit, but now these two rotations certainly seem like it's offense over defense still, right? It is, yeah. yeah. And and um, the the observation of the rotation of defensive sectors have have helped me in the last I don't know five years really, you know, anticipate real rollovers in the market. Yeah. And um, from my observation, what you will see when the market is really ready to roll over, yeah. you will see defensive sectors shooting off into that leading quadrant, really picking up strength. Yep. That, is the, that is one of the first signs. It's, it's, it, it happens earlier, in my experience, than uh, money moving out of offensive sectors. So you will right. first see the move into defense yep. before you will see the move out of offense. And, and it's not happening yet. You, you, yeah. know, you, you know, if you look, especially look at the, uh, the weeklies, but also the monthlies, to a lesser degree, the dailies, you will find that um, defensive sectors are slow, underperforming. They are, they are not leading. They yeah. are not leading the market. And, and that fact alone uh, makes me very hesitant to call for a massive top and a bear market and all kinds of dark Thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> now, one of the other big changes we've observed probably in, into March now and maybe into April are some of the leading growth names like, you know, Tesla, Apple come to mind, Alphabet sort of chopped around. Some of those names that had been dominating starting to slow down. But then you're seeing a bunch of other sectors like industrials, financials oh, yeah. and others. Are you seeing that sort of evidence on the RG as well, that rotation into more value? Yeah. Sectors? I mean, you, you uh, I mean, on top of my head, financials, yeah. um, inside uh, weakening but rolling back up. It's one yeah. of the strongest rotations that we know of. Yeah. Uh, industrials has been, that's like a sniper. It's yeah. been <laughs> really slow, but it's really strong. The, the price chart moved to all-time highs. They broke to new all-time highs. Yeah. If you look at the number of new highs in, in, in individual stocks in industrials, it's really strong. Sure. So that sector is really picking up and it's not, you know, it's, it's re really close to the benchmark, but it's starting to move away. So it's like a really under the hood sniper move going on there. Yeah. Um, and then there is materials that is doing uh, sure. a little better. It's inside improving, starting to pick up. So, you know, materials, uh, financials, um, and, and energy is also a sector that has done very, very well. It's rolling over a little bit right now. But um, one of the things that I looked at in this article um, is not only look at the relative rotation, but also mm -hmm. look at the price charts. Oh, great. And then especially look at the uh, little bit longer term price charts. And then you will see that there are um, uh, energy materials, industrials, financials, they are pushing to serious overhead resistance levels. Right. Um, so my, my case or my storyline or something that I'm observing here is when these sectors take out these massive overhead resistance levels, and we all know when, when a market takes out one of these massive overhead resistance levels, that's usually you know, the signal for an acceleration higher because you're... Yeah. You're taking away a lot of the distribution, a lot of the um, uh, supply that was at that level. That supply yep. is now gone, right. but the demand's still there. That usually accelerates stuff. So if you see energy, materials, industrials, uh, financials moving higher, yeah. I mean, it's 
they're not the biggest sectors in in the universe. Uh, yeah. Although financial is actually pretty pretty it's getting big. bigger, yeah. Um, uh, but the question, so I think that that could definitely offset the money that we now see outflowing out of tech, because mm. that is undeniably there. There is there is at least a hesitation or some sort of a pause going on there. Yeah. And if this sector rotation, if this can pick it up and offset that money coming out of tech, I mean, God knows where the S&P can go. So with that in mind, right, so with the defensive sector still sort of lagging, those growth you know, sectors have had a really good run and yeah. now you're starting to see some, some pullbacks. And then these other areas of the market sort of resuming, looking now forward here in Q2, how do you position yourself given the uncertainty and what you're seeing? Is it sticking with some of these value sectors that have started to emerge? Is it remaining with the tech leadership that still is out there like uh, and, and others like um, you know, others? From, where do you from, look? Yeah, from a trading or an investing investing perspective, yeah. I would I would still, you know, if if you're if you're holding positions in those larger names yeah. and you have some sort of a trailing stop loss type of idea going, because you don't know, they might they might jump another 10, 15 percent, you know, it can happen overnight. Yeah. Uh, so that would be that would be a shame to to lose out on that. But definitely be a little bit more cautious. Maybe close in your stops there. Um, and if you're, I mean, if you're if you're taking it from a portfolio perspective, if you're invest, invested in those larger tech names, over time the weight of those names in your portfolio yeah. has grown. grown pretty good. Yeah. You know, so from a good. Um, portfolio management perspective, yeah. let's say if you started out with 10, 15, 20% of your portfolio in those names, in those sectors, yeah. and that has now grown to 40%, given number, yeah. it, it would be a wise thing to do to bring it down, back down to your target allocation. So shave something off, pick up the gains, still keep your, your, your weight and your allocation, and move the money that you took off the table into maybe financials, materials, industrials, the mm. other sectors that are coming up. It's a, it's a matter, it's, I mean, a lot of people don't um, value that enough. They yeah. just look at a price and a chart and, and that's it. But in the end of the day, it all comes down to constructing a portfolio. And that is something that is completely different than analyzing a chart and saying, hey, you need to buy this or you need to sell that. Yeah. You know, you, you, you worked at a big, Portfolio management firm. It's a whole it's, different it's, set it's, of skills it's, you got to figure it's, out. It's a different way of thinking. Um, yeah. no. You know, and, and I would I would love for our users to think much more as a portfolio manager yeah. rather than just that stock picker and like, hey, this is a good stock, this is a good sector, and then yeah. just go into whatever kind of a position. That's like, it's it's a much broader perspective that you need to uh, need to. Uh, I actually wrote an article about that, like. Two three years ago, yeah. Um, I'll I'll put the link. We can put the link in the uh, in the For description sure. of the video. Yeah. But it's called. Uh, <clears throat> I think that the title is something like, uh, um, in between brackets, technical, right? Market analysis and portfolio construction mm. are two different animals in the same zoo. <laughs> And it deals with like, you know, so here, here you look at a market, but how do you translate that into a portfolio? How do you yeah. do that with weights, overweight, underweight, et cetera? It's, it's so interesting. Stuff. We've had some conversations <clears throat> with some of the technical analysts that are running mm -hmm. money. People like Katie Stockton with an ETF. Yeah. There are a number in the CMT community running money. I've had conversations with a number of them, and they have all had that same reaction. This is a different mindset that you need it to is. have, which is separating the analysis from actually putting the right bets in your portfolio and managing risk, right? Which is another big That is what it too. is, yeah. And RRG, arguably one of the best ways I've seen to think about those potential areas of risk and make sure you, you know, lighten up in areas that are starting to uh, underperform. Julius, mm -hmm. thanks for coming in. Good to see you. Thanks for making the trip here just for this, but I, I have, know some other things yeah, too. Yeah, I'll have some other things to do this but, week. But uh, uh, good to see you and, uh, and uh, safe travels home after we're Thank done. Thank you, man. Cheers. That's uh, Julius De Kempner. Julius is the uh, founder of RG Research, senior technical analyst here at StockCharts.com. I love that thinking of the RG, the weekly and the daily. And that article that we mentioned going right to the charts and actually thinking about what the charts tell you about overhead supply, demand, and all of these other features that you can relate the uh, RG to the actual charts uh, as well. Julius has done such a great job of sharing a lot of his content here on Stock Charts TV over the years. We are super excited to keep bringing his uh, message of rotation and uh, thoughtful analysis to uh, all of our viewers. With that, let's get to our three in three, three charts in three minutes to tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one.
Here we're looking at breadth data, and we talked about some breadth uh, indicators earlier in the show. We looked at the bullish percent indexes, looked at percent of stocks above key moving averages. Here, we're just looking at the raw breadth data in the form of the advanced decline line. These are called cumulative advanced decline lines. So every day we're looking at how many stocks closed up, how many stocks closed down, keep a running total of those figures for different groups of stocks, and you have these data series. And what you like to look for is how these are trending versus the trends in the S&P 500 or whatever benchmark you're looking at. The top one's the most important for me. That's the New York Stock Exchange Advanced Decline Line. It's a pretty broad universe of stocks. A lot of uh, sectors and styles are represented there. So I like it as sort of a, uh, a one-off. If there was one at AD line I would look at, it would be this one. It is making a new 52-week high here in the, last, uh, in the last week. The S&P 500 large cap and the S&P 400 mid cap AD lines also have been making new all-time highs in March. Uh, we'll see if that plays out. Uh, we don't have this updated for uh, uh, today's close just yet. This is as of Thursday's uh, close. Look at the S&P 600 small cap AD line. Still technically neutral in my mind because we haven't broken above that December high just yet, but pretty close to it. So market moving higher and breadth data continuing to improve is a bull market phase. Get concerned when the S&P makes a new high on weaker momentum. That's the kind of thing we saw before uh, the uh, COVID drop, we saw the market move higher on weaker momentum. Other major tops like 2007 had a similar pattern. So market higher on strong momentum uh, or strong uh, breadth, that is. Uh, hard to, uh, to deny the strength underlying those uh, upswings. Chart number two is looking at the VIX. And we talked about our market recap. I talked about the VIX level. And this, uh, these lines represent those three levels that I was pointing out. The VIX below 15 is a low volatility environment. We spike above 15. That's my initial warning that maybe things are getting a little squirrely, shall we call it. VIX above 20 is where we are at a high uh, possibility of, uh, of more meaningful drawdown. The last time the VIX spiked above 20 was at the October uh, low of last year. And while we didn't end up going much lower, it did tell me to really think about potential downside risk. And, you know, I'm happy the fact that it didn't go much further than that. But remember, a VIX getting up to around 50, it first has to get through 20. So that initial threshold can be a good sign of potential risk off positioning. VIX above 28.8, we'll call it. Uh, this came from a conversation that I had with uh, Tim Hayes of uh, Ned Davis Research. I think that was earlier in the year in uh, 2023, but uh, they had done some deep, uh, deep work on, uh, on the VIX and they found a VIX over that 28.7, 28.8 level, if I remember right, was a, uh, was a concerning level of volatility and that major drawdowns only really happened when the VIX got off to that point. So, those are the levels that I watch. Those are the levels that I have alerts set for. I would encourage you to do the same. And again, as long as we remain below 15, we're in a low volatility upswing. Finally, we highlighted the chart of 3M. That was a daily chart we looked at in our market recap. Here we're looking at a weekly chart. And this is using the adjusted data because that's where we're focusing on total return. But this is one of those where there's something interesting happening with, uh, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it's that spinoff that they just uh, processed today. So that's probably what's causing the uh, gap in the chart. I would expect Charts like 3M to, uh, to sort of be in flux here, but a good reminder that charts are the beginning of the process. Seeing a, a move in a chart uh, and then thinking about what questions you need to ask to better understand that. Check out the uh, spinoff on 3M. Overall, I would say the chart remains strong and becomes strong if we can break above the resistance uh, from these uh, highs in 2023 and earlier in 2024. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank you so much for joining us. For today's uh, The Final Bar, special thank you to Julius DeKempener joining us here live in our studio in town from the Netherlands. For Stock Charts and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.